Ladies and gentlemen, this is the World Series of Politics, where Brendan Bussman and Brent I race through the turn on key legislative and regulatory developments around the gaming world. As these two come up to the green flag, let's get into this race for expansion and opportunity for the industry to grow until we hit the checkered flag on another episode of the World Series of Politics. Welcome back to another World Series of Politics podcast. I'm your host, Brant Iden, along with my co-pilot, flying somewhere over, I don't know, are you overseas? Where are you, Brendan? It's always, I, a, it, you know, you never can tell. You're in some hotel room somewhere. Where are you today? I, I, I am actually in the United States in an undisclosed location. Last week was the time I was overseas uh, in, a, in a desert that is very near and dear to me, uh, you know, literally halfway around the world. But uh, today I'm stateside and uh, will be at least for the next couple weeks uh, along the way before I have to head, uh, uh, not sure if it's east or west, depending on how you want to do it. It's either the far east or the middle east. So I guess somewhere east. So, Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to catching up next week. Obviously, we will be out west at IGA and looking forward to that. I think we've got a couple of panels and we've got a lot of activity planned. So I will see you next week still, correct? Absolutely. I, that, that is, uh, that is the, the plan, and I look forward to uh, being in the same location as my co-pilot. Uh, and fellow Cape Crusader and making sure, uh, you know, we, we bring the, uh, the good word of gaming to all parts of the earth. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, we have got a great show planned. Obviously, it's been a minute. We have been swamped and inundated with a lot of states, a lot of activity. So we want to catch you up on where things are at. And then we want to jump right into our great guests. So let's talk about Georgia. Obviously, crushing defeat in Georgia. Uh, I was there, boots on the ground, last week. Uh, awful experience once again in Georgia, Brendan. Well, I have, I have my thoughts, uh, which I have not been shy about. Uh, uh, what's your takeaway? Well, you know, and and as somebody that has tried to legalize gaming in that that state for about fifteen plus years at least, now that I sit here and think about it, uh, and I still go back to the quote I gave uh, last week when everything was said and done, which is, "You're really never going to know the true vote count unless you bring all the liars to the table." Uh, present company excluded when I say that, but until you get all the legislators <laughs> at the table to say, "Hey," Here's what's really happened, and here's where I really was at. You're never really going to know if you were there and got it done, but clearly there was a lot of people negotiating in, in not the most honest of terms, and, and that goes from a lot of sides. So, you know, it Look, is what I will it is, say and we'll this. be back there again, so... Well, you got you, we got to keep at it. Obviously, a ton of education. We're now five years into Georgia. Uh, Representative Weedauer, the bill sponsor uh, for mobile sports betting, did a fantastic job, as you say. I mean, I think the caucus was there. I think he delivered. I think he'd spent a bunch of time educating his members. We've obviously seen him do a lot of press. Uh, he's very versed in the bill. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, all polling shows that, you know, Georgia, uh, the citizens of Georgia and the consumers are looking for this. But, um, you know, we're going to go back to the drawing board. Obviously, we've got some work to do with leadership. Uh, there were some counting issues. There's no doubt about it. I won't say on whose side, but that's where we're at. Uh, and we're going to move on. We've got a lot of other states there ahead of us yet this year. Uh, one, and I want to focus on actually a, the district because you and I have a wager out there. You are out on Minnesota to pass. I was on the district. The bill had not even been introduced until last week. I now have a mobile competitive bill in uh, that I can at least wager on in the district. So, uh, I mean, I had I was I was making a bet. And I didn't even have a bill out there yet. So, uh, tell me what's uh, you know what's your take on Minnesota? What do you think about the bill in D.C.? Well, well, first and foremost, let me say one more thing. Back on Georgia is you know if legislators would realize that they won't lose their elections based off of gaming and it's a non-issue people would actually move things a lot faster, especially in these states that have CAs. Now, as it relates to our wager here, which is the most important thing we talked about when we started this year off in January, uh, I'm still very bullish on Minnesota. I still think it gets done. Uh, obviously, I think the biggest problem you have is there's a lot of handouts right there, uh, and I still hold back going, you have a deal in place. You have all 11 tribes on the same side. They're the stewards of gaming, and everything else does not matter. But I'm very bullish on that. I am encouraged, though, by D.C. because, as you said now, you actually can be in the race because you have a bell. Um, so it does make <laughs> me a little bit nervous because this is when I, I tend to fall off because, like I lost last year's on Missouri, 
I counted on timing, not on process um, of playing out. But, you know, the whole thing about the district, um, it's one of those that over the course of time, you got to move to a competitive environment there. It's the only way it's going to work. You've got to blow up what's existing there. It's been flawed from the start, going back to the premise that they needed to hurry and get this done and offer the monopoly. It's time to start over, and this is the way to do it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Obviously, D.C.'s going through their budget process. This is going to be a, a major focal point. Getting a competitive sports betting market in D.C. will be excellent for the consumers there who have got a terrible product with Gambet at the moment. I mean, it sounds like they're going to get a new product either way with potentially a FanDuel product. But at the end of the day, an open and competitive consumer market uh, is going to be best for the district from a revenue standpoint and, by the way, from a gambler's perspective. So, I mean, look, I'm, I'm bullish on it. I'm glad that they're both moving in. In the right direction. It's going to be a horse race down to the end, and who does the bottle of Pinot go to this year remains to be seen. Uh, with that, I want to pivot because we've got a couple of excellent guests on, and I want to talk about, since we're over in the Northeast, I want to talk about Maryland. We've got about a week and a half left in Maryland. Obviously, iGaming has been at the forefront of the conversation this year, a bill that's advanced from the House over into the Senate. Negotiations continue, but the big sticking point, one of the big sticking points, is this conversation about cannibalization. And we've got two uh, excellent guests from the analysis group on who just recently put out a study to talk about this very issue. I'm going to welcome Mickey and Laura to the show. Thank you, Brant. This is Mickey Ferry. I'm happy to be here. And thank you. This is Laura Laughlin. I'm similarly happy to be here as well. Well, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Brendan, go ahead. I was going to say, welcome to the show. Maybe give us just a little bit of background about the analysis group. And, and how you derive some of the things that are in the study out there. I think that, let's start with that premise off the bat and, and to make sure people know that, you know, you actually are really good at what you guys do. Sure, I'll just introduce Analysis Group um, as a whole. So Analysis Group is one of the largest international economic consulting firms. We have over 1,200 professionals and offices in about 14 locations around the world. Uh, the company's been around for over 40 years. And my name is Mickey Ferry. I'm an economics PhD trained at the University of Chicago, and I'm currently a vice president at Analysis Group. And, and I'll kick it off to Laura to introduce herself now. Yes, um, and I am Laura Laughlin. I similarly have training in economics, master's degree, and a lot of experience in putting together consumer research that can be used to help answer you know, complex real world problems. And that's kind of what we do at our job. Well, it, it's been great. So, you know, I, I've gone through the report. I've taken a hard look at it. I want to talk a little bit about Maryland, but let's not bury the lead here, which is, uh, uh, let's just jump right into it, which is land-based revenue has increased with iGaming by almost 2%, and overall revenue up, according to your report, is at 46%. I mean, how does this debate about cannibalization still continue to exist? Talk to me about that. That's right. So, I mean, Brent, you, you uh, summarized the two key results. First, you know, you want to think about uh, these states that don't have iGaming yet, they have land, you know, um, so we, what, what we call land-based casinos in the study, or in-person gaming. Um, and the, uh, those casinos are on a certain trend in terms of the revenue they're generating. That was really what, what you know, me and my team focused on in the study. And then once iGaming comes out, it's this whole new venue where consumers can game outside of the land-based casino. And overall, we saw that expanded the market uh, uh, very significantly by about 46% when we look across the six states where it's been legalized. But then the question is, okay, we have people now um, you know, gaming from their mobile devices, gaming from their computers at home, are they still gonna go to the casino? And the answer to that question from our study is a resounding yes, and Overall, they're even going to increase their visitation to the casino and their spending at the casino after iGaming was implemented. Um, you know, there was a lot of rigorous research that went into this study, looking at the revenue data across all the states that, that we had revenue data from. And then Laura is, is a real survey expert here. She's done a lot of consumer surveys, and she dug really deep with, with surveying people in these states that have implemented iGaming, as well as Maryland and other states that are considering iGaming. Um, you know, Laura, I, 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 I'm going to kick it over to you. If you could talk about some of the specific insights from the survey, I found those to be just fascinating. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it's an interesting story because we look at sort of big picture macro numbers and say, look, there's you know no evidence of cannibalization, but what would a consumer say, right? What what does a person who uh, might have a, a bunch of apps on their phones that might relate to casino games or potentially iGaming, if they're in a state where iGaming is legal, um, how does that relate to how they think about iGaming versus um, in-person gaming and, 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 and other activities? And so I think what we found, and this is by talking to you know consumers that are in states where iGaming um, is legal and in states where iGaming is um, you know not yet legalized, um, that people you know really think of iGaming um, as a separate product, as a separate activity, and it's very different in their minds from. Um, from in-person land-based casino experiences. And land-based casino experiences are thought of as an event, as a social event, as you know, different things that come along with it. Whereas iGaming is a, is, a, is, a is, is a different activity. And I think that, you know, additionally, I think it also provided some support for how we, how we think about iGaming and, and how it relates to sports betting as well, and online sports betting in particular. And I think that this consumer-based research, you know, helped us understand that that people thought of these products differently and that they don't, you know, cut into one another or cannibalize one another. You, you know, Laura, you just hit the, one of the things I've said for years is, is there's, there's a different customer mindset when it comes to this, uh, which helps lead into what you and Mickey have just talked about of the, the cannibalization being just one of those issues out there that people are throwing at this to try to slow down the process. You know, from the research you saw over over time, and, and this question is actually to both of you, you know, how is this, I mean, obviously your study shows this as an additional revenue driver, but what is the mindset of somebody going into that to know, hey, how does this, you know, how does it complement each other in some cases, or how does it bring in a customer that you're not bringing in today? Um, Mickey, do we need to take this? I can start with what we saw a little bit in the survey uh, which is people, you know, think about, um, you know, oh, there's, they, they might have loyalty programs. They might think about, um, you know, they, they might be engaging in sort of lottery style casino games and realize, oh, well, actually, I'd, I'd like to play a little bit differently and might, you know, choose a different, a different app or, or, or try different, different products. And I think that really it's about, you know, I think that, yes, there's, um, you know, different demographics that are that tend to be interested. You know, it's, it tends to skew a little bit younger when we're thinking about eye gaming, and a little bit older when we're thinking about in person. But I think you know, across the board, we are seeing evidence that people, you know, of all demographic uh, backgrounds, are interested in, in both. I think that's right, and I'm going to chime in too. There's, I think there's kind of three different effects that that we, I, I would say, measured pretty specifically, and and there might be others out there, but the three that that I'm going to point to now are one we have people currently visiting out of state casinos so you know think of a consumer in um, in, in uh, New York which is one of the states that that uh, we were focused on a lot of those people are not visiting casinos in New York they're going to New Jersey they're going to Atlantic City or they're going to Pennsylvania to visit casinos there once they have the option to game online they can do that from their own home in New York so New York is generating increased revenues from those out of state, from, uh, from those uh, you know, New York residents who are currently going out of state. And then the second one is just this, this idea that people, you know, the casino, like Laura was talking about, going to the casino in person is an event. It, you know, it's a social activity. People do it maybe once, twice, three times a year with their, you know, friends, family, um, for, uh, 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 for kind of special occasions. But now you can increase those people on, on what we call the intensive margin. So people who you know, kind of go to casinos uh, somewhat regularly, uh, once they start gaming online, they can game online more regularly and realize you know, kind of how much they enjoy gaming. We saw that um, from the survey that people who were gaming online said that once they start gaming online, that they actually increase their visitation to the land-based casino, um, you know, visiting more frequently than they had previously. And then the third one is taking uh, people who currently are gaming 
you know, what we call illegally, um, not going to a land-based casino, not doing it on a legal online channel, but doing it kind of off the books. And once they have a legal online regulated marketplace that increases the safety and security of, you know, the, I mean, people are putting real money into these things, so they want it to be, uh, so it's beneficial for it to be regulated. And that will also, you know, that's another effect where we could see uh, money that's previously being spent off the books now being spent through the legal online channel. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, the, those are all great points. And certainly you, you mentioned Atlantic City. Uh, I see that obviously in Michigan, uh, you know, another market that you studied uh, very similarly. You have these conversations with folks. It's the same sort of premise, right? They may spend their weekends, uh, their entertainment value. They may go to the down to the casino, downtown Detroit or or, or any of the other 23 tribal casinos in the state for uh, entertainment. They may go for a concert or a show on a weekend. But if they're looking to casually play, they may do that. That on a Wednesday from their home. So at the end of the day, they, they're, the consumer's probably spending a little bit more. Now, let me ask you a question, which, and I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit on this one, which is, why do you think that this debate is so rigorous if it just seems so obvious? Uh, what, what are the, what's the counter to this that we continue to hear, and, and why is that not necessarily correct? And I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit on that, Mickey. Now you're asking me to play psychologist, Brant. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you got, you get, welcome to the show. You get to do it all here. There you go. We're a one-stop um, shop, Mickey. Th that's right. So I have seen, I, I think it's, I mean, it, you know, it's one of those things where people are resistant to change. And this is- That's a great point. You know, right. This is a change. I mean, these are, these are big markets. They're in, in I mean, I kind of think- Across the 11 states, I kind of think of each state as about $3 billion um, in, in, uh, in uh, land-based casinos. Some are smaller, some are a little bit bigger. But, you know, between New York, Illinois, um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Michigan, these are all about $3 billion a year. And that's, that's a pretty big market. So, right. so there, I mean, there is a resistance to change. And there are stories of how technology has not gone well for certain industries i think back to blockbuster and netflix that's what my phd dissertation was on and netflix came out blockbuster did not do well after that um, right but there's other you know industries where technology helps and expand i mean you know just uh, uh, just back to the movie example movie theaters still exist and people are watching netflix at home people still go out to movie theaters for a special event and uh, you know restaurants is another example of entertainment i'm ordering grubhub sometimes for meals at home but that doesn't stop me from going out to the restaurant so you know i think there are stories people can tell as to why this may not be good but you know all the data we've looked at and the examples of six states that have legalized it already with new jersey and delaware for for over i mean over 10 years we're just not seeing that kind of cannibalization people are you know people are worried about you know, Mickey, we're, we're starting to run out of time a little bit here. Laura, did you want to add something? I don't want to interrupt you. And I was just going to say, people use their phones all the time, right? And so this is just another way, another game for people to play on their phones. And people, you know, are playing these games anyway. You are not going to go to a casino to play on your phone. It's a very different product. And I think that that's really sort of the thing to keep in mind is that what, what, people, what people think when they're engaging in these activities are very different things. And so that's the part that I think is, you know, the big difference. Well, and I guess as we close out here, you know, think about, you know, as we opened up the show, Maryland's got, you know, they're down to the wire as it relates to getting this across the finish line, hopefully. You know, you've talked about change being difficult, but what's that message you say to a Maryland legislator or, you know, as we look at other states down the way, whether that be New York, Illinois, others of these that we know have started to flirt with the conversation. What's that message to legislators, Mickey and Laura? How do it, because obviously there's an economic argument and then there's also the consumer facing thing. So what is that as we, as we close out our show today? Maybe I'll start with the economic argument, Laura. You can, you can chime in on the consumer piece. Um, I mean, the economic argument is, the, is like all the data and evidence is showing that, I, that legalizing iGaming is going to significantly in, significantly expand the gaming market in your home state, and that will lead to increased tax revenues. It does not appear that it will come at the expense of land-based revenues at all, and in fact, it appears land-based revenues 
are even complementary to iGaming, and they're going to mod, and, 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 and it looks like they're going to modestly increase. Also in Maryland, the state has been growing. You have the benefit of the MGM National Harbor, which is like the largest land-based casino outside of Vegas in the country, I believe. Um, and you know, MGM has the robust MGM app, so so there's complementarity too for um, you know for for your largest land-based casino. I mean, I think that the, the consumer story is pretty much the same. It's that this is, you know, what we've seen from the consumers is that people don't change. They, they you know, they maintain or they are likely to increase their visitation of land-based casinos uh, following uh, the introduction of iGaming. And there's really no reason to believe, based on both the economic data as well as the survey-based data, that, um, that iGaming cannibalizes sources of revenues. I've got one more specific number, um, and I encourage any listeners who are interested to uh, to read our study. I mean, the the whole study is 167 pages long, so you can read the first 20 pages, which the executive uh, 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 which is the executive summary. That'll give you a good idea. But there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of I think great charts and and uh, results throughout our study. One specific Maryland number that that we haven't discussed. Uh, yet that I think is important is of the uh, of, uh, of all the people we surveyed in Maryland 30% of them are currently traveling out of state for a typical casino visit and then of that 30% there's 45% of those who are considering iGaming so these are people you know it's about a third of your casino goers who are visiting out of state somewhere else and uh, that's a great opportunity for Maryland to, to convert some of those into iGamers in state that's a massive opportunity. Uh, yes, I, I love ending it right there. I'm also going to highlight this Mickey line of the qu quote of the show that tax revenue is up and it doesn't impact land-based casinos. That's it. That's all you need to say. Bada boom, bada bing. Great show. Mickey, Laura, thank you for joining us. My co-pilot, Brendan, sail and sail on, my friend. Uh, and we always appreciate you joining the show. For all the listeners out there, always feel free to contact us. Let us know what's on your mind. Let us know what you're thinking about. And uh, this has been another a World Series of Politics podcast with your host, Brad Eiden and Brandon Bussman. Thank you all. You've been listening to the World Series of Politics podcast with Brendan Bussman and Brent Eiden. We'll be back at the starting line very soon. This has been an IGB production. For the latest news, views, analysis, and data on the global gaming industry, head to iGamingBusiness.com.